Chicago Public Library. Her name is Joanna, Joanna Russ, and she's a senior archival specialist. Joanna. All right, thank you, Hallie. Um, as Hallie said, my name is Johanna Russ. I'm a senior archival specialist at Chicago Public Libraries, Harold Washington Library Center, right downtown. I've been working here about eight years. And the whole time I've been here, one of my biggest projects has been working with the Chicago Park District Archives. We have over 106,000 landscape and architectural drawings and over 62,000 photographs from the Chicago Park District's long, long history. All of those are available for research here at the library, and 10,000 of those images are available to view on the web from anywhere. Um, I worked closely with Julia Backrack, our tonight's speaker, both uh, before she became, sorry, when she was still working at the Park District. She worked at the Park District for 27 years as um, in their planning department. She did a lot of historic projects for them. She was kind of their in-house historian and she retired. Uh, but before she retired, she worked very closely with us to make sure that this amazing collection found a home where it could be more available for the public to research. Um, then she went on to retirement. She has started a thriving consulting business and we were lucky enough to get to partner again to put together this exhibit that is up on the ninth floor of Harold Washington Library Center. The link is in the chat. It will still be on display for another couple of months. It should be coming down at the end of this year. So we hope you'll have a chance to come and see it. Uh, this weekend is a great opportunity, as Hallie mentioned, because Harold Washington Library Center is a site for, for Open House Chicago. Um, so come in, pick up a, a guided tour brochure in the lobby and make your way up to the ninth floor after you're seeing all the other sites in the building. Um, so without, Further ado, I will hand it over to Julia. Okay, you're up, Julia. Share okay, your screen. Okay, thank Great. you. Okay, I hope you all can see that. I Perfect. suppose if you can't, you should tell Hallie, right? You can see it. Um. So thank you so much. I'm very excited about this tonight. And, um, you know, in essence, this program, the Olmstead Legacy in Chicago, um, for Chicago kind of kicks off the um, a, a, a celebration that's going to be longer than a, a year. It's called Olmstead 200, um, because in 2022 will be Frederick Law Olmstead's um, 200th birthday. He's not with us. <laughs> But, um, and there is a really fabulous website um, and Ian will provide you with a um, link to that. So um, the Olmstead legacy in Chicago is a very rich topic. Um, the Olmstead firm uh, was in Chicago and contributed to Chicago's parks over a long period of time. Much of the story is unknown. The part of the story that a lot of people do know is that Frederick Law Olmsted was the landscape architect kind of working arm in arm with um, Daniel Burnham for the World's Columbian Exposition. And I am trying to... Put your cursor on your screen and oh, click right. it, it should work. You guys taught me that last week. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So, um, so Frederick Law Olmsted, um, in, in designing the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, um, just before the fair opened in the spring of 1893, there was this fancy gala dinner in New York. And, um, you know, all these uh, East Coast architects who had contributed to the fair wanted to honor Daniel Burnham and Frederick Law Olmsted because they knew that this was just going to be the most incredible thing that, that they had sort of collectively created. And when Olmsted uh, couldn't attend because he had a conflict that night, Daniel Burnham wanted to make sure that he was properly credited. And so the first thing Burnham did when he got up on the podium is he made this just beautiful speech about Frederick Law Olmsted 
He said, an artist, he paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountainsides and ocean views. And I always thought this was such a beautiful quote because it just so, um, it, it really encapsulates uh, Olmsted's work. It's kind of amazing to think that the field of landscape architecture didn't really exist before Frederick Law Olmsted. So he really gave us sort of the kind of iconic idea about what an urban park should be. And of course, his seminal work was Central Park. But I want to kind of give you a little bit of overview about his life because he was a fascinating man. Um, and uh, he was um, from kind of a Yankee family and, you know, born into a, a, a affluent family, but he had all kinds of trials and tribulations. Um, as a three or four year old, he witnessed his mother um, die. She had died of an accidental poisoning. And then when he was ready to attend Yale, he got sumac poisoning in his eye and had temporary blindness that lasted a really long time. He never ended up attending college. I think his father was worried about what was he going to do. He started trying all these different careers. He did scientific farming in Staten Island. He spent some time in England and um, looking at all of the fabulous English landscapes and then published a book, The Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. He then got involved in publishing and in journalism, and he spent some time in the um, American South uh, before the Civil War and ended up publishing a series of really important books that ended up being kind of a call for, um, you know, abolitionism to, to end slavery. Um, in 1857, he became the superintendent of Central Park before the park existed. Um, and that same year, the park commissioners decided to have a competition for its design. And there were over 30 entries. Olmsted teamed up with an English architect named Calvert Vox, and they submitted this plan, the, the Greensward plan that you see at the bottom here. They were really an unknown team, and yet they won. So he started working on improving Central Park, but the improvements then were interrupted by the Civil War. During the Civil War, he became the head of the National Sanitary Commission, and then he spent some time uh, as the head of a silver mining um, enterprise in California and really fell in love with Yosemite and ended up writing a report that convinced the Congress to make Yosemite into a national park. Um, he uh, then ended up going back to New York and teaming up with Vox again and they began their practice or they returned to their practice and began designing a number of different parks and landscapes. Um, in 1867, uh, 68, they were hired to lay out the town of Riverside, the first planned community in the United States. And like me, I'm sure many of you have had the great joy of getting lost in Riverside because instead of um, kind of using the standard military grid, which most Midwestern towns do, they decided to create this system of um, kind of of, of lots and roadways and walkways, all based on the fabulous topography along the Des Plaines River Valley. And they also set the houses back very far on the lots and created these beautiful landscape sites. And of course, we all still love Riverside today. While working on Riverside, um, Olmsted was asked by some prominent Southsiders to come and look at the site that would become uh, Chicago South Park. They really were actually referencing that they wanted something like Central Park. And when he got here and he looked around, did he say, ah, what a fabulous place for a park? Not exactly. He said, if a search had been made for the least park-like grounds within miles of the city, nothing better meeting that requirement could have been found. He was not in love with our natural landscape, but he did think this site, you know, it was very flat and very marshy. Um, he thought it had one redeeming feature, and I know you could guess what that is. Of course, it's proximity to Lake Michigan. He said the lake could be made by artificial means, no more grand or sublime. And so Lake Michigan really guided the um, development of the plan that he and Vox created for South Park. And as you can see here, the, um, this was a 1,055 acre landscape. It was one composition and included the Western Division that became uh, Washington Park, the Eastern Division that became Jackson Park, and the Midway Plaisance, which they actually named it the Midway Plaisance in their plan. 
his idea was that you would enter the Eastern Division by boat from Lake Michigan, navigate through this very rugged series of waterways, very lushly planted islands and peninsulas. That would be kind of like this kind of part of the sublime experience. Then you'd go down this formal canal down the Midway Plaisance into a little um, lake in Washington Park. And when you got to Washington Park, you can see that big kind of green blob on the top. And that was a sheep meadow. And yes, every year they got a new flock of English downy sheep that roamed in the meadow. Um, and it was also a meadow where you could play sports. Um, Olmsted uh, and Vox wrote like a 40 page report that went with the plan. Um, and it's a very long and detailed report, but um, in it, they said that the element of interest that should be placed first, if possible, in the park of any great city to provide an antithesis to its bustling paved walled in streets. This requirement would best be met by a large meadowy ground of an open, free and tranquil character. This idea that the meadow would be this play space, um, it was more than you know just a, a beautiful space to play. He really felt that urban parks were the great American experiment where people of all different backgrounds and means could mingle and play games and get to know each other. And um, you know, of course, there's there was um, you know a long. I mean, every group in Chicago over history has not had the complete same access. But interestingly. Um, over time, really, Washington Park has been a very kind of diverse park. And even today, there's even cricket played there. Um, and one thing I just want to mention, I've been working with the Washington Park Camera Club. Here's a photo of the same beautiful uh, meadow that was taken by Dwayne Savage of the Washington Park Camera Club. There's going to be all kinds of programming um, this year and next for Olmsted 200, including a project by the Washington Park Camera Club. Um, the Olmsteads uh, didn't have a chance to continue to be involved in South Park for a while. Things kind of moved a little slowly, partly because of the Great Fire and partly because the park commissioners had some land acquisition issues, particularly at the Eastern Division. And so these two plans show you what was actually implemented um, in color shows what was built based on Olmsted's original plan by 1880. In 1889, a, a group of prominent Chicagoans had decided that Chicago should host the next World's Fair. In that year, 1889, the, there was a World's Fair in Paris. And so a delegation from Chicago went to Paris to kind of study the fair and come back and put their proposal together. And um, they did end up putting together a proposal. And much to the surprise and chagrin of New York, Chicago won the honor to host the fair in February of 1890. That August, they asked Olmsted to come back to Chicago and help select a site for the fair. He did a study of seven different sites and then they ultimately decided that it would be in Jackson Park. Now, I just wanna tell you, we're gonna break in a moment for some questions, but I just wanna tell you about what was happening in Olmsted's life by that time. Olmsted was very close with his brother, John Hull Olmsted, who died in 1857. In 1859, Frederick Law Olmsted married his widowed sister-in-law, Mary Perkins Olmsted. I know you might think that's weird, but that wasn't that unusual for the Victorian time when there were so few safety nets and no social security or anything like that. Um, she had three children and uh, the oldest was John Charles Olmsted. And he ended up going into business with his stepfather, father, <laughs> um, Frederick Law Olmsted. And um, they then Mary and Frederick Law Olmsted had two children. The younger, the son, there was a daughter and a son, the son they named Henry. When Henry was about seven or six, six or seven years old, Frederick Law Olmsted realized that the most valuable thing he had to give his son was his name and that he had kind of blown it. So they changed Henry's name to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. He went by Rick. He too went into the family business. Um, in 1883, they moved to Brookline, Massachusetts. And this is now a national historic site. And uh, by 1890, when they were working on the fair, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. entered Harvard and uh, John Charles was um, in the firm as a partner and um, Frederick Jr. would help during the summers uh, planning the World's Fair. So I think we have a moment or two here for a couple of questions.
We do. We have two questions right up the bat. Um, this is going all the way back to your first slide. Uh, Beth wants to know where were the pictures on the first slide that you showed? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember? Um, yes, one is the World's Columbian Exposition. The one in color is Washington Park. And then we had the World's Columbian Exposition, which was the image from the um, promotion for this program. And then the um, that really cool one with the kids playing in the water was Mark White Square, which um, doesn't really exist anymore. It became the Gwaine Park, but it doesn't look like that. But I'll but I'll show you some other ones. Great. And then just uh, Ted wants to know what's the origin of the word plaisance. I know I don't. I'm not. I know I'm not even saying it right. Plaisance. 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 Yeah. So that's a good question. I so. Um, so in his description of the plaisance, he called it a fenced in area. And I was like, yeah, that doesn't do it for me. And so um, and so another scholar kept saying a plaisance means a fenced in area. And I was like, yeah, nah. So when <laughs> back in the day, when we first kind of got on the internet and we had Google Translator. So like the first time that I actually could find like a dictionary that was like Google Translator, one of the first things I went in there was, and I put in the French English dictionary was plaisance and it said a place for boating. And I was like, yes, of course, it's a place for boating because he's obsessed with boats and he wants you to get through the plaisance by boat. So that's my, def that's what I think. I'm not, I don't speak French very well, but I did find in one French English dictionary that said that's what it was. Great. Okay, that's all the questions okay. we had. All right. For now, so you can continue and we'll stop again uh, and have some more opportunities. So please feel free to put your questions in the uh, Q&A. And so now our second part is the World Columbian Exposition. And of course, this is a topic that could be its own whole thing. So I'm gonna try to not tie myself down too much. But um, so I had mentioned that Olmsted's sons were now involved in the firm, but he also, you know, it was a pretty big firm and he also had a new, very talented young partner, Henry Sargent Codman, who had trained at MIT and then also did some training in Paris. Um, as you know, he was working side by side with Daniel Burnham and his right hand man, John Wellborn Root. Um, sadly, neither Codman nor Root lived to see the opening of the fair. As many of you probably know, Root died in January of 1891 of um, pneumonia and Codman had an appendectomy um, that went wrong um, before the opening of the fair. But um, the four of them did work closely together uh, at the beginning uh, and they together worked to lay out the fairgrounds and Olmsted later wrote this really fabulous paper that gives a lot of details about how the uh, White City, the um, World's Columbian Exposition Fairgrounds were planned. And he tells a story about how these the four men were together and they had these huge pieces of brown paper. And they were probably sitting at a big table, but I picture them like sitting on the floor with these big pieces, kind of the templates of the various shapes. And um, he said that they decided that there should be a great architectural court with the body of water therein, that there should be a formal canal leading northward from this court to a series of broader uh, waters of the lagoon character so that the principal exposition buildings would each have water as well as land frontage and would be approachable by boats. And so basically, you know, here's the plan. It's sort of a tweaking of the original uh, of the, the original plan for the Eastern Division with the interconnected system of lagoons, but then with this very formal kind of T-shaped um, court of honor. And of course that was a formal focal point of the landscape. The Statue of the Liber of Statue of Liberty, I just said the Statue of the Republic had her back to Lake Michigan. She was facing William Morris Hunt's administration building. And so, you know, these ideas, this very kind of formal layout in that portion of the landscape um, and then the idea of these large white buildings, um, you know, and, and very classical buildings all kind of goes back to the Beaux-Arts style, which really comes from the famous French school, which is the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, French School of Architecture and uh, Art. And so that was the style that the 1889 World's Fair had followed. And so, you know, again, then our fair had these huge buildings made out of plaster that 
you know, again, this, this uh, Beaux-Arts style kind of harks back to images from ancient Rome and Greece. And kind of late into the process, there was a decision to whitewash all the buildings. It would save money, but it would also kind of unify the design. And, um, and so then, of course, it becomes known as the White City. But the exception to that, as many of you know, was Louis Sullivan's transportation building, which was actually pretty colorful with a um, famous golden arch door. So with that, with these vast areas of white, the landscape would become all the more important. The green of these kind of uh, planted spaces and the blue of the sky and the water would be really important. And in kind of talking about the planning of the landscape, Olmsted talked about how important the um, wooded island, the smaller islands, and the shorelines he felt were. He wrote, the desired result is to be accomplished by a large, largely by a thick, luxuriant growths of herbaceous aquatic vegetation along the shore, rooted partly above and partly below the surface of the water. The idea was to create obscure and poetic beauty through the intricate conjunction of various forms of vegetation um, and complex dispositions of light and shade. And so there you can see the wooded island in the middle. Um, I know it's gonna be really hard to see this map on the top. This is from the National Park Service has, um, in addition to the, the, all the Chicago Park District collections that Joe told you about, the National Park Service in the last couple of years has digitized tens of thousands of Olmsted materials, drawings, and um, photographs. And, you know, much to um, Olmsted's chagrin, the wooded island he really felt should be kind of, it was sort of his idea of a nature sanctuary. He wanted it to be very natural with the beautiful, you know, ancient oak trees. It was decided that it would also serve as the um, site for horticultural exhibits because the horticultural building that you see right here was right across the way. So you'd cr cross the bridge and then all of these, you know, ball seed and all these other nursery companies would then have their displays on there. Um, so I don't know if you can tell, but this like walkway um, that you see at the bottom right was right next to the horticulture building. So here's the beginnings of these sort of fanciful horticultural displays. This is not what Olmsted liked. In fact, he hated this kind of stuff. He didn't like fanciful flower um, displays. He really considered himself trying to create scenery. And so it, he didn't want it to be these kind of artificial um, showy kind of displays. So he, you know, he had to swallow a couple of tough pills, but oops, sorry. Um, but one thing he was completely obsessed about, if I haven't made this point already, was boats. And um, there's a, a series of books called the um, Olmsted Papers that have a lot of really, um, you know, basic, like the actual archival material of Olmsted's letters, his writings, his reports. And this recent um, volume, volume nine, includes the making of the Columbian Exposition. There were over 50 entries about his specifications of boats. He said an important contribution, it has been calculated by the designers, would be made through boats moving upon the waters, but this only provided that it shall be practicable to procure boats in considerable numbers of a character as finely, delicately, and subtly adapted to the general scenic and poetic purpose as other elements referred may be. So he would get down to like these long letters about, for instance, the awnings on these electric lunches that they had to be those stripes shouldn't be, you know, I don't remember the exact colors. They shouldn't be red and white. They've got to be green and white. He um, was very specific that he wanted authentic, um, like all these interesting boats and, um, you know, water vehicles coming from all of these different places. He wanted a Japanese fishing barge with real Japanese fishing family on the barge that there should be gondolas from Italy. They had to be real gondolas and they couldn't be rowing. They had to be sculling. Um, and in addition to this whole thing with boats, he was also very specific about waterfowl and his firm was put in charge of ordering waterfowl and the exact numbers of every kind of bird that they wanted, which included even pigeons and ducks, but it also included pelicans and flamingos. And they had to figure out how many and where they were gonna go. <laughs> And, um, but this idea of gondolas, you know, you could get, he even talked about how much you could charge. They, they would charge extra so that you could have a gondola ride. It would take you to the front of the Fine Arts Palace. The Fine Arts Palace, of course, you know, one of the elements throughout the landscape was beautiful sculpture. But I love to point out that, of course, the lions 
that we have at the Art Institute uh, were smaller bronze versions of the ones in front of the um, Fine Arts Palace. And there were lots of beautiful works of sculpture kind of integrated into the um, World's Columbian Exposition kind of throughout the exhibit. And this is just a smattering. Um, so Olmsted, um, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm, uh, Olmsted, one of the things was that he was very concerned um, initially about the amount of engineering that would have to go. He was worried that they really wouldn't put the the money if they were going to pick Jackson Park and that but no they did and so there was this huge amount of engineering and he knew that once they like reshaped the landscape and had these you know all of these beautiful um, shorelines and edges he was very concerned about making sure that they were properly clothed and so um, he said you know with that, they, that you'd have to be worried about the clothing of several miles of newly made raw sandy shores with a clean, graceful, intricate, picturesque green drapey, drapery, varied in tints and pleasing in its shadows and reflections. All together, we have planted on the shores of the lagoons, 100,000 small willows, 75 large railway platform carloads of collected herbaceous aquatic plants taken from the wild, 140,000 other aquatic plants, largely native and Japanese irises, and 285,000 ferns and other perennial herbaceous plants. The whole number of plants that were transplanted to the ground has been a little over a million. So this gives you an idea of the magnitude. And then just to remind us of the magnitude of the whole campus, 69, uh, 690 acre campus for the World's Fair. Here's just a few facts about that. It was, it had a $28 million construction budget over 775 million today. It took 40,000 skilled workers to build it. Um, they used 70, Five million feet of lumber, 18,000 tons of, of steel and iron, 30,000 tons of staff, and remember that's the plaster mixed with hemp, the, the plaster material for the buildings. Just in the first year of construction, there were 700 accidents, 18 of them fatal, and altogether there were 65,000 exhibits. As you probably know, the, the World's Columbian Exposition opened in um, it, on May 1st of 1893, and it closed on October 30th of 1893. So it was a six month period. And um, it's been calculated that if you wanted to try to see every single exhibit at the fair, that you would have to go around the clock, which of course it wasn't opened around the clock, and it would take you three to four weeks. And so now we can take a few more questions. Turn on my microphone. Okay. Now we uh, do have a question about the Obama Center. So just going to do a check-in. Are you going to talk a little bit about the Obama Center? You know, I didn't because I trying to cram all of this in here. But if you, but the but interestingly, the Obama Center does sit on part of the site that was the um, the horticultural building and the women's building. They were right next to each other. Okay, so the question is: Please discuss the building of the Obama Center in Jackson Park. And if this sets a precedent uh, in the major parks for further building, maybe even along the lakefront. Uh, well, this, like the legal aspect of it is just totally not my expertise. So I don't, um, I am gonna talk a little bit about the proposal to build the Field Museum and Grant Park, but I, I don't wanna misspeak. There's lawsuits and there's still lawsuits going on today. So I'm probably not the best person to speak on that. Okay, you know, we all know you know a lot and it's okay for you not to know everything. <laughs> so tell us what became of all those sculptures Carol wants to know. Well, I will be um, in a moment showing you what it looked like right after the fair, but um, it the, there were um, a lot of fires kind of both spontaneous and um, well, some arson, but then some just, it was, everything was so flammable. Um, and uh, so a lot of things burned. There's a really good fiction book, which I didn't put the link on there. I should have, I thought about it, called The Lake on Fire. It's a historical fiction that kind of talks about the fair and kind of after the fair. Um, and, uh, and then um, the rest were demolished, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that in part three. <laughs> okay. Joan wants to know, the Midway Plaisance has a dip in the center. Is that due to the original intention of the waterway connecting Jackson and Washington parks? Oh, you guys are too good. That will be in part three. 
<laughs> okay, hold on. We'll answer that. Um, okay, was it ever possible to take a boat from the fair site to Washington Park along the Midway Plaisance? No, but that will be covered in part three as well. Oh my gosh, we, we <laughs> stopped too good. soon. No, this is good. I, it, it shows that I've kind of like, you know, wet the interest in that particular <laughs> aspect. So you jumped over the Japanese building on the island. Will you be talking about that in part three? No, I forgot to say it. Thank you. I, <laughs> did I miss this? I missed a slide. That's did I, so did I, did I click twice? I think I clicked twice. So, Maybe. okay. So thank you for saying that. And luckily I'm going so fast here. I think I do have a moment to go back. So I was talking about how the Wooded Island it, you can see this map in 1891, Olmsted was told you are gonna have to deal with the fact that there's gonna be um, horticultural displays on the island. And so that was a little bit of a bitter pill, but then um, he started getting all these proposals for um, actual pavilions on the island. And he wrote, after a time, demands came for the use of the island for a variety of purposes. And at length, we became convinced that it would be impossible successfully to successfully resist these demands. When we reluctantly reached this conclusion, the question with us was, which of these propositions urged, if adopted, will have the least obtrusive and disquieting result? And when he's saying us, it's really, it's he and Burnham that are dealing with all of this together. And of course, um, they decided that out of all of these proposals, that the most palatable was the proposal to create, uh, kind of recreate an ancient Japanese temple uh, that was called the Ho'oden, which um, was then given as a gift from the Japanese government and was meant to be permanent. And as many Chicagoans know, it was there until the um, sometime in the 1940s, I think it was 46, um, when some boys playing with matches supposedly burnt it down. It was really probably an anti-Japanese, like political, you know, awful thing. Um, so, but it was really quite beautiful. And if you go to the Wooded Island today, um, Yoko Ono sculpture sits on this site. Okay, thanks. Her. All right, so thanks for that question. Who asked that? Thank you. I don't, I, I already got rid of the question here. Okay, so what, Cheryl wants to know, what was the purpose of the expo? 65,000 exhibits of what? Oh, that's good. Well, you know, during the 19th century, World's fairs were um, very uh, popular and there were a lot of them. And um, they were um, a way, you know, it was a time when people could travel and, you know, obviously you would have to take a ship to come here. Um, and it, a lot of it was promoting um, commerce. And so there were these huge buildings, you know, with all kinds of educational things, but a lot of it was really very commercial. And there was this ginormous um, manufacturers and liberal arts building and all like, you know, every um, country got a chance to promote all kinds of products that they created. So um, lots and lots and lots of, of Chicago industry had that chance to kind of promote their goods at the fair. But then there were all kinds of um, exhibits that were, you know, quite educational. There was a woman's building and, um, uh, you know, it, I, I, it was just really kind of filled with attractions and nobody could have seen all of those 65,000. And they still exist today, except we don't call them world fairs, we call them expos. And the one in Dubai just opened. So oh. if you want to travel. Anyway, one last question. Um, and it is, was, wasn't Olmsted planning the Biltmore Estate at the same time as the World Fair? That's, yeah, you guys are so good. <laughs> um, yes, he was working on, um, on Biltmore at the same time. And I think John Charles Olmsted was spending a lot of time in North Carolina. Um, and this, that, the, that series, I think there's um, nine of them. And actually maybe, um, Ian, maybe you can sh share that link because the link is, um, I think the link was from the um, National Association of Olmsted Parks. And it, and it has about the whole series of the Olmsted papers. And uh, the last volume kind of covers the end of Olmsted's career 
and uh, and it's largely about Biltmore and the World's Columbian Exposition. So yeah, that was also a good um, comment. Thank you. All right. So you have a couple questions you have to cover in the next section about the dip in the Plaisance and taking a boat to the fair site. <laughs> And then we'll catch up with you uh, when you finish with your third part. Okay, I think I'll answer those, but we'll 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 see. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so part three, we uh, somebody was asking about after the fair, and here are some photographs. There are a lot of photographs about what the site looked like after the fair, and it's it's, it's pretty daunting. Um, so yes, you know it was very flammable material, and then. There were firms hired to to actually like ex you know um, tear down the rest and even a lot of the um, staff material was kind of scrunched up and used as fill. So here we are, you know, right after the the fair, um, probably in late 1893 or early 1894. At that time, the Olmsted firm was hired to come back and and uh, transform the site back into usable parkland. By that time. The firm was called Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliot. And yes, Frederick Law Olmsted was becoming, you know, quite elderly. Um, and Rick, the younger son, was finishing Harvard and joining the firm. And uh, so it was Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliot. The older son, John Charles, had been a partner for a number of years, but now actually had his name as part of the firm. So the first thing they concentrated on in early 1894 was creating this plan for the Midway and basically saying, we always really thought we should get that water to connect the two parks, that there should be the canal down the center of the Midway. And we recommend it's the first thing that you concentrate on to the park commissioners. And so in, I think, April of, um, of 1894, they voted in favor of adopting this plan. And then in the Chicago Tribune in August, um, you can, you know, I was able to find that the laborers, there's a little illustration of the laborers starting to dig the canal. And this is a little drawing that's in the collection at the Chicago Public Library. And it's showing that they decided to kind of do the first stage. They didn't have money to build the whole thing. So that, that summer in 1894, they decided to dig the three feet down and they were planning on returning and completing the canal, which you could see would have gone much deeper they ended up bailing on the project. And so the person who said, you know, is that why there's the dip in the um, midway? Yes, it never had water. They just left that dip in the lawn and it's always been like that ever since then. Um, before, even before the fair had closed, Burnham started really pitching the idea of saving one of the buildings. He, he knew this was gonna be, a, 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 he knew it was a really important moment for Chicago and he felt that one of the major pavilions should be saved as a permanent, um, you know, kind of um, attraction to kind of remind us of how important this was. And around the same time, Marshall Field offered to donate a million dollars to buy some of the natural history um, collections that had been at the fair. And so really this ended up uh, uh, leading to the creation of the Field Museum. And so essentially, um, it was decided that the old fine arts palace would become the field museum. And as you could see from that bottom photograph, um, they didn't really spend a lot of money on the building. Um, they really, that million dollars really went to the interior and to the collections. And so um, the field museum was in there for quite a while. And as you know, later, um, Julius Rosenwald helped, um, to, he came up with the idea and donated money and helped transform it into the Museum of Science and Industry. Um, so in, by 1895, the Olmsted the, uh, firm, Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliott, uh, completed their um, new plan, the comprehensive plan for transforming the Jackson Park Fairgrounds back into parkland. This is the plan and that little tiny writing that you see on the left, I basically just retyped um, into this white text on that um, the bigger that you can actually read on the left and so they're telling you what the main features of the plan are they say the lake that there will be broad views provided um, of Lake Michigan from a shore drive so that's sort of the beginnings of South Lake Shore Drive the fields that there would be quiet uh, pastoral landscapes for strolling tennis and croquet and baseball um, and if you look at kind of the that big round field it actually gets sort of modified 
um, later, 1899, 1900, to also provide a golf course. The lagoons, which we know has always been important to him, would be uh, have intricate and busy shorelines and, and uh, providing an almost complete seclusion with scenery from many points on the shore and from boats, boats again. And then the Field Columbian Museum, which we know, you know, the decision had been made um, a couple of years ago to save it. And the area around it would be designed upon formal lines for the sake of architectural har harmony. And interestingly, there was also going to be, um, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but there was also going to be a music court, which is that kind of area, just kind of kitty corner um, southeast of the museum. And then a gymnasium, this kind of oblong shape on the right, right along Stony Island on the sort of west side. Um, a, it says, and a gymnasium for public re recreation and also for, uh, would also be formal parts of the park. And um, several years ago, I spoke with Charlie Beveridge, who is the editor of the Olmsted Papers, and he told me he believes this was uh, either the first or one of the first times that the Olmsted firm had ever done this idea of an open air gymnasium, which was these running tracks that could also be used for bicycling and a playground in the middle. So, you know, this is the 1895 plan. The Chicago Tribune then printed this rendering that I was so excited to find that really envisions what the plan will look like. And you can see right along where it says Stony Island, you can see the, um, the uh, open air gymnasium. Um, so then, you know, that was 1895. They, that, I guess I should also say that if you know the park today, the park um, largely follows, you know, still really follows the 1895 plan. Um, so the Olmsteads really weren't involved for a few years. Um, and the Olmsteads, the father retired, Frederick Law Olmsted retired and died in 1903. The two brothers, Rick and John Charles, um, formed a new firm or kind of renamed the firm, the Olmsted Brothers in 1898. And then in 1903, after a few years of not really hearing so much from Chicago, they were asked to come back to Chicago. And one of the main reasons they were, uh, that the South Park commissioners hired them is that the um, land, the, the park that had been a city park would, had now been transferred to the South Park Commission and renamed Grant Park. It had been, it's a very old park, I'm sure you know that, and it had was named, renamed in honor of Ulysses S. Grant and um, Burnham and uh, Marshall Field came up with the idea of building a, a brand new field museum and putting it right in the middle of Grant Park, and uh, and of course um, Montgomery Ward was against this idea, and there were a bunch of lawsuits, and so that they asked the Olmsted brothers to create a beautiful plan um, to kind of improve the landscape around the proposed um, museum and they were knew that they were going to have some public um, you know uh, problems because of the lawsuits and so they also asked the Olmsted brothers to create a model of the park with the um, museum in the middle and put it the model in the lobby you know in the main floor of the art institute to kind of promote the idea. Um, while they were working on that in Chicago, the South Park commissioners were also thinking about um, the need to have a whole new series of parks within their taxing jurisdiction that by the um, early 20th century, there were um, large areas of the South Side that had really become squalid tenement neighborhoods. And of course, many of them were near the stockyards. And this was all within the, um, the actual geographic you know, taxing jurisdiction of the South Park District. Um, and, you know, of course, the um, famous book by Upton Sinclair, The Jungle, um, talked about that area, about the back of the yards. It was famous for its, its smell, noticeable for miles, depending upon the wind. So they knew that there were, you know, well over a million people had, um, immigrants had kind of settled, many on the south side of Chicago, and it was very difficult living conditions, and that they felt uh, that there needed to be kind of a new type of park. And the then superintendent of the South Park District, J. Frank Foster, had some very progressive ideas about what these new parks could be. And so they, um, J., J. Frank Foster had a meeting with John Charles Olmsted in December of 1903, and they had this sort of brainstorming session and kind of came up with this long 
list of all of these amenities that that um, Foster really felt would be very useful to people living in these um, kind of difficult crowded neighborhoods, they decided the park should have a ball field, running track, sand pits, swimming pool, which is a big deal, swimming pool, um, wading pool, outdoor gymnasium, a playground, landscaped areas with shade trees, and a community center, which became known as a field house, with a library, lunchroom, auditorium, indoor gymnasiums, and club rooms. And so the um, John Charles Olmsted was very excited about this idea of a new type of park, and he sketched this plan on the back of a piece of hotel stationery while he was meeting with um, Frank Foster. And then as the ideas continued to gel, this little bird's eye view was um, printed in the Chicago Tribune. So this was in, 19, in late 1903. The South Park commissioners had to have new legislation passed that would allow them to create new parks for the first time in 30 years. And so the legislation, the idea was that they got permission and uh, passed a bond issue. And their idea was that they would create um, 14 parks, seven squares, meaning that these were parks of uh, 10 acres or less in size and seven called parks because they were 11 to 320 acres. And the map that I show you on the right um, has the existing, you know, Jackson Park and Washington Park and all of those kind of dark red squares and rectangles are the new proposed parks. And they were very systematic. They were working with a lot of, um, you know, this was like Jane Addams and the social reformers were involved. And they did intensive studies of these neighborhoods and came up with these vicinity maps. There's a lot of these in, the, um, in Joe's Chicago Public Library collections where they studied, they wanted to make sure that there was a park within walking distance, within a two mile radius of every home in these very densely um, uh, developed neighborhoods. And so the um, field house was a whole new idea, that idea of a community center that had never existed before anywhere in the world. It's a Chicago invention. And of course, the job went to Daniel Burnham. He hired a new young architect, Edward Bennett, who had been trained at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And of course, you know, fit Burnham's um, style very well because he went to the Ecole. And, um, and so Bennett came up with some plans, you know, working with Daniel Burnham, for a series of new buildings, none, they, none were exactly the same, but they all would be made out of um, exposed aggregate concrete. Uh, they would be these classical buildings, but by building them out of concrete, they could build you know, relatively quickly and mold the, um, the classical details right into the, um, into the exteriors. And one thing also, you know, it kind of the, 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 a lot of the ideas for these small parks were kind of harking back to the World's Columbian Exposition and these swimming pools, you know, there were really very few parks, I think maybe one or two parks that had an outdoor swimming pool before this. Um, so the idea that each of them would have an outdoor swimming pool, they, the way that they planned um, the location of these pools was around, you know, they would create these sort of complex of the classical buildings around the swimming pool, almost like a mini court of honor. And of course the Olmsted brothers were working really closely with D.H. Burnham and company. And so they you know, came up with plans for seven squares, which were again, the ones that were 10 acres or smaller, sometimes as small as three acres in size. And so they had to kind of cram all of those recreational features into a much smaller site. Here are two examples. Jensen later complained that these parks had too much gravel and not enough green. And then some of them were larger. And one of my favorites is Sherman Park. Um, and um, one thing that's really interesting for Sherman Park, which was 55 acres, is the Olmsted brothers originally proposed the plan on the left. And I don't know if you can tell, but that kind of like the white rectangle was supposed to be water. So that was supposed to be a canal. And then the, um, so you'd get kind of this rectangular island in the middle. And of course it would have been kind of expensive because it would have been, you know, a canal with concrete edges. But um, when the park commissioners looked at it, they said, but we still, especially with a larger park, we want to have all of these new elements, but we also want to have parks that still kind of hark back 
to the old days of what the Olmsted firm had given us, like Washington and Jackson Park. And so then the plan on the right ended up being the revised plan and Sherman Park ended up with an island in the middle that was ball fields and kind of that looping lagoon where you could people could go um, boating and, and things like that. And, uh, and then of course, the kind of classical building um, complex all kind of in, kind of at the north end of the park. And, you know, so the first 10 of these parks were built and opened in um, 1906. So they started building in 1905. In one year, they built 10 of these first parks. And it was really, it revolutionized what people expect out of parks. Um, it very quickly, um, they, people started pointing out that Chicago had this new system of parks. There was a big park and rec conference, a uh, national park and rec conference in Chicago. And President Teddy Roosevelt issued a national statement suggesting that municipalities send representatives to Chicago to see these parks and kind of bring the idea home because he said um, that they would get to see one of the most notable civic achievements in any American city. And, um, and so the, the um, Olmsted brothers were then asked to continue, you know, working with the Burn with D.H. Burnham and Company on some additional parks for Chicago. Um, so there were the four that were held back, and then they were then hired for uh, a few more. I think another four parks. And uh, but this gives you an idea on the uh, this kind of summary. They they were really doing a lot of record keeping of how many people used every facility, how many times each facility was used. And you can see the combined annual attendance for these parks, and some of them very, very small, um, were over 5 million. And uh, so the idea then got really disseminated to other cities very quickly. The Olmsted Brothers and D.H. Burnham and Company were both national firms. They were speaking at conferences. They would get hired for other projects. And of course, D.H. Burnham and Company also included a whole chapter on parks in their famous 1909 plan of Chicago. When I said D.H. Burnham and Company, it's really, I'm sorry, Daniel Burnham and Edward Bennett were the authors um, of the 1909 famous plan of Chicago. And there's a, a whole chapter on parks where they specifically kind of recommend this type of park that they called small parks um, that we now call neighborhood parks. So I think I I think I did the timing okay, Hallie, because we still have a couple of minutes. Yes, we do. We have some questions, so that's perfect. And I think you answered some of those questions that people had, so that's great too. So uh, Joan has a question. What was the South Park District? Was there not a single Chicago Park District? Oh yeah, I didn't really explain that too well. Um, so in 1869, there were uh, there was legislation. There was sort of a group that had been working, rallying to try to get a parks um, some type of a um, kind of uh, legislation that would allow for the creation of parks. And uh, they were having a lot of struggle, and so it, it ended up there were three separate groups that were kind of working separately but helping each other. And so within a few days of each other in 1869, these groups each had their own acts that were, you know, they helped each other, but they were all a little different based on their own neighborhood. And so it was the South Park Commission, the West Park Commission, and the Lincoln Park Commission. And the South Park Commission was the largest. If I go back to that map, you can kind of get a sense. This showing where the Chicago River is all the way down to Indiana was really within their taxing jurisdiction. So you today, in 1934, all of the separate park districts. By that time, there were 22 separate park districts. Um, we're all consolidated in 1934. So today, if you're a Chicago resident, your tax dollars are going for all parks and for the Chicago Park District. But back then, before 1934, if you lived anywhere in this map that I show you, then your tax dollars were only paying for the parks in your neighborhood. Okay, so we have two questions that are basically asking the same thing. What about the parks on the north side? Did they plan any parks on the north side? Yeah, so the thing that one thing that's really interesting and, you know, would be maybe fun someday to just do a program on neighborhood parks is that this idea influenced parks in Chicago and influenced parks all over the country. So up on the north side, um, there were parks that had um, plans that were designed by um, uh, Perkins, uh, Dwight Perkins. 
and um and so that was up on the north side like hamlin park as an example and then on the west side jens jensen had his own interpretation of these neighborhood parks and he was working with the architect um uh, zimmerman william carby zimmerman um so yeah they each kind of did their own interpretation uh, and then you can start going to other cities and you'll start recognizing these features. Um, and it all came really from this Chicago model. Cool. So Bill Tyre from the Glessner House uh, OHC oh, yeah. site has a question. He wants to know, there's a new open air track that was constructed just south of the Obama site. Would this be where Olmstead planned his open air gymnasiums? And was do you think the idea of the new track is an homage to Olmstead's original plan? Well, not exactly. So the tract, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on how you interpret. Like maybe you could say it is, I don't know. But basically, I don't know if Bill noticed um, there was a track that was getting moved for the, from the Obama um, to, to build it. And that was kind of part of the original site of the track. But, um, I, there's, a, for anybody that wants to do a deeper dive, I was a author of a report called the Section 106 Report for Jackson Park. If you Google that, it'll take you to a, sh a page that gives you all the documentation on Jackson Park, and it'll give you a little bit of a deeper dive about the um, tracks. It was it was kind of funny when they first did the, the I think they only came up with one of the tracks originally. Um, it was very geared towards bicycles and there were problems with scorchers back then. And so even though I think they were thinking it would be more for runners, it turned into kind of a fabulous bicycle thing. Um, but so there's been a track in one form or another, either one or two tracks kind of since that time. So I guess since they wanted it moved, maybe you could say it's an homage, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> And Gene, one of our guests, is mentioning that he also did a very similar park system in Louisville, Kentucky, with the small parks, boulevards, and bigger parks. Yeah, so Louisville is a great Olmstead city. And if you go to that Olmstead 200 website, they um, have information about Olmstead parks all over the country. And Louisville is, is one of them. Olmstead Brothers, I was visiting my sister in Seattle a few years ago and realized they have great Olmstead uh, brothers parks in Seattle. I've been doing some work for the U of C and realized the Olmstead brothers designed the original U of C campus. So the Olmstead brothers were so prolific. They existed until the 1960s. They did over 10,000 projects and um, this Olmstead 200 site is just fantastic. Um, so you can sign up, get newsletters, attend other virtual programs. There's a, there was something, there's something going on in Washington. You could you could fly to Washington. <laughs> There's going to be stuff all over the country. So you can either stay home and do it or you can go travel and do it. So I, you really can't talk about this area without talking about the devil in the white city. So what are your thoughts on Larson's devil in the white city uh, from its perspective on Olmstead burning, et cetera, in particular? And then secondary, secondarily, um, Jessica is curious to know if you also have any thoughts on H.H. H. Holmes and his own rudimentary but incredibly creative approach to architecture in contrast. <laughs> well, first of all, The Devil in the White City, it, I mean, I don't love all of Eric Larson's book. It is truly a masterpiece. And I, I, I did it. I read it. I've read it three times now. I read it for my book club. And I read it with a very critical eye this last time. And there really are, you, you really have to be pulling, sort of picking at little hairs, you know, to, um, to come up with any um, real contradictions. The one thing that I didn't agree with, I, so I think it's really good. I think it's really good. I think everybody should read it. Um, the one thing that it did, it sort of made it sound like that Burnham and Olmsted had met, that they met because of the World's Columbian Exposition. And I, you know, Olmsted was so famous by then. I am sure that Burnham already knew Olmsted. You know, Burnham, um, you know, was younger and, but by the time of the fair, um, you know, he had been involved in the Chicago parks for um, already really um, at least 15 years. So, but that's, that's such a minor thing. Uh, so I think it's really a wonderful book. As far as the, um, as far as the murder house, I, I gave a couple of Devil in the White City tours 
this year. And it's so hard to wrap your brain to stand there and try to picture what 63rd Street was like. And that just drives me crazy. Um, but one thing that, I mean, this is just such a sideline to your question, but it just, it, it's when the dots start connecting, it kind of blows your mind. I've been doing a lot of research on um, some lesser known architects. And one of them was Anders G. Lund. And I just recently did some research on his daughter who was also an architect. And um, they lived like right around the corner from there, right at the same time on Parnell. And so like, then I just think, oh, I wish there was some Lund people around so I could ask them what, if, what that was like when they discovered that it was the murder castle. So, um, but they didn't, none of them had any children. So I don't think they're any more at Lund's love. So anyway, that, that's a bit of a sideline. Okay, one last question. We'll wrap things up. Can you, uh, Kristen wants you to mention Dwight Perkins' relationship to Olmstead. Well, I'm obsessed with Dwight Perkins and he and I had the same birthday. I can't remember, I think, I can't remember what year he was born, but um, I was born a little later than him on the same birthday. So I'm really obsessed with him. Um, he went to MIT and um, was, when he was really stressed out as a student, I mean, he's so fascinating. He deserves a whole other program. Um, but when he was stressed out as a student at MIT, he was going and hiking in the um, parks and parkways uh, that Olmsted had just recently created or was really even creating at that time in Boston. I mean, this is just, this is just mind blowing to think about the fact that the you know, Emerald Necklace, which was this regional system of parks and forest preserves was being developed while he was a student at MIT. And that he talked about how, when he was really stressed out, he would hike there then he brought the idea back to Chicago and was the kind of proponent of the forest preserves, of the Cook County Forest Preserves, which he did with Jensen. So that's huge. Great. Okay, so Julia, thank you very much. I did not mention all the wonderful comments that you got, but oh. everyone, you're a treasure. Uh, we're lucky to have you. You're passionate about your topic. You did a great job. It was fantastic. Well, so we got a lot of great accolades there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before